Okay, well, we're going to have Dr. Abelhosen come in and uh, tell us how to do hybrid procedures. You all met Dr. Abelhosen already, so I'm not going to introduce him. Thank you, John. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to talk about hybrid uh, uh, interventions in adults with congenital heart disease, and hopefully it'll dovetail nicely into uh, the talks given by Dr. Lax and, uh, and Dr. Levy. Um, as with Dr. Levy, I have a number of pertinent disclosures, so uh, same degree of distrust. Um, I will not go over board exam questions. Historical perspective. So as said earlier, really much of the credit uh, to the success of this field goes to the surgical pioneers, the early surgical pioneers, as well as the surgical pioneers of our era, which include uh, Dr. Lax. Um, and we know that uh, really starting in the 1940s and then into the 50s with cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, we have seen just huge leaps forward in what we can do for these for, uh, patients and really surgery has become a refined art now. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, transcatheter uh, 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 techniques. Transvascular catheterization techniques were developed as early as the uh, 1930s, uh, but were generally used for diagnostic purposes until the 1960s. And the early transvascular catheter interventions were limited uh, by a lack of uh, biocompatible materials uh, that could be crimped into uh, uh, delivery catheters. Um, and here you see one of the earliest forms of um, uh, transcatheter intervention. This is an example of the uh, Rashkin balloon septostomy in a patient with uh, detransposition of the great arteries and a restrictive uh, atrial communication. This is the kind of procedure that, that uh, Dan is coming in in the middle of the night to do. Um, luckily, I don't have to worry about this because it uh, looks pretty uh, intense here, uh, smashing this thing through the baby's heart. Um, but that's where it started. Uh, and really, the last two decades have witnessed an absolute explosion uh, in uh, percutaneous transcatheter interventions, catalyzed by a, a couple of uh, key factors, as I see them. Advances in non-invasive imaging techniques have been key. Um, really, echocardiography is the workhorse uh, for us, transthoracic echocardiography. But MRI, CT um, have allowed more accurate diagnoses. So we, we know what's going on before going into the cath lab in general now. We're not going in necessarily for diagnostic purposes in the vast majority of cases. Advances in catheter, device, and wire design have been absolutely key. New materials such as uh, nitinol, uh, which is no longer new really, but uh, it's a material developed I think in the late 60s or early 70s, but came into use uh, for device design in the 1990s and has become the basis uh, for the design of many of our occluder um, and self-expanding stent technologies, and then advances in imaging within the cath lab or the operating room, wherever we're doing these procedures. Transesophageal echo, intracardiac echo, epicardial echo, uh, rotational angiography, etc. And last um, is uh, the advent of these hybrid procedures and combining the strengths of uh, surgeons and interventional cardiologists to really minimize uh, the length of procedures, decrease the morbidity and mortality risk, and, and hopefully improve outcomes. Um, so transcatheter techniques have some clear advantages over traditional surgical approaches. Uh, and, and these include, um, and they have some, some downsides obviously, but, but the advantages are uh, pretty obvious. Shorter hospital stay, shorter recovery time, minimal scarring, less pain, and really, hybrid interventions can combine uh, the benefits of uh, surgical intervention with uh, some of these advantages of transcatheter techniques. So let's talk a little bit about the hybrid operating room or the hybrid cath lab. It's not really for the faint of heart here. It's a construction of a hybrid room is not cheap. The price tag runs uh, between about three and a half to five million dollars. Uh, and success really hinges on um, the collaboration between multiple specialties and multiple specialists. Um, and really many hybrid suites, uh, th there was so much excitement about 10 years ago about just every hospital getting hybrid suites, but, but they haven't realized the, the high utilization that uh, I think many uh, centers expected. Uh, even at busy centers where um, they're doing three to five hybrid cases per week. Um, so it's imperative that the room uh, is also used for non-hybrid procedures, and that way it's easier to justify a multi-purpose room that can be used as, a, as an operating room if you need to do an operation or as a cath lab if you need to do a cath, and if you need hybrid procedures, it, it fits perfectly as well. This is the basic anatomy of a hybrid operating room or a hybrid cath lab. You have to 
have uh, a uh, obviously a cath lab or OR table, preferably tilting. That's much more comfortable for our surgical colleagues uh, when they're trying to uh, visualize uh, and uh, get access uh, through thoracotomies and sternotomies. Um, you have to have the fluoroscopy equipment. Uh, typically, in most uh, hybrid suites, these are not biplane uh, labs. These are uh, C arms with rotational and geography capability, which is nice because it allows you to do 3D reconstructions um, of uh, images. And then you need anesthesia and monitoring equipment. So, and, and space, frankly. You need space for what is a larger team. This is the kind of hybrid procedure that is done in uh, the pediatric uh, age group uh, in infants, uh, the uh, uh, hybrid stage one of the Nor Norwood operation, where um, there is uh, surgical banding of the pulmonary arteries, and then there is uh, stenting of a PDA. And I, I know, I believe Dan did one of these with Brian uh, yesterday or the day before. So uh, uh, becoming a more frequent hybrid operation. But we don't really do this operation in the adult congenital patients. What do we do in adult congenital patients? Well, where we really need some of these techniques uh, is in patients with RVOT anomalies, uh, the majority of whom uh, do not have uh, conduits but have native RVOTs, uh, which are generally large and uh, difficult to address using pure transcatheter techniques. Um, What's the issue with pulmonary regurgitation, which is usually the problem in these case, uh, patients? Well, it occurs after relief of uh, pulmonary stenosis or uh, surgical repair of tetralogy of Fallot. It's well tolerated for 10 to 20 years, but really beyond that, we start to run into trouble with uh, right ventricular enlargement, right atrial enlargement, arrhythmias, a reduction in um, right ventricular systolic function, progressive tricuspid regurgitation, et cetera, et cetera. This is... Um, the MRI of a typical patient with uh, uh, a transannular patch, barely any pulmonary valve left here, and wide open pulmonary regurgitation with RV enlargement and ventricular tachycardia. Um, and these are the hemodynamics with the RV and the PA pressures looking exactly the same. If your PA pressure looks exactly like your RV pressure, you have severe pulmonary regurgitation. Uh, what happens if you leave these people alone? Well, arrhythmias, heart failure, eventual multi-organ failure, renal failure, decreased cardiac output state, uh, liver congestion, etc. cetera. And um, so we want to avoid that. Um, is repeat surgery bad? Um, in this population. And this is a, a study that we participated in uh, in patients with tetralogy of Fallot, adult patients with repaired tetralogy of Fallot. And we looked at arrhythmia uh, prevalence in this population, um, both atrial as well as ventricular arrhythmias across multiple centers uh, around North America. We had, I, I believe, 560 patients. And uh, you got a five to tenfold increase in atrial or ventricular arrhythmias when you're comparing patients that have undergone one reparative surgery versus those that have undergone five five reparative surgeries. Now, one could say, and, and you know, it, it would not be a, a um, I think, an unreasonable statement that if you've had to go, undergo five operations, well, you probably have a much more complex form of tetralogy of Fallot. Maybe you have pulmonary atresia with MAPCUS and, and you required urinary focalization procedures. But be that as it may, um, there's um, a growing body of evidence that, you know, it's better to try to avoid cardiopulmonary bypass procedures, repeat cardiopulmonary bypass procedures, if that's feasible. Um, and entry into the chest over and over can be um, hazardous as well, especially when that RV or the RA is plastered up against the back of the sternum. So I borrowed, I think this is, this is a, a slide that uh, uh, Dan had that, sorry Dan, I stole it from you. But big RVOTs are a problem. Uh, we don't have any currently uh, approved devices for the treatment of big native RVOTs. This is the Harmony uh, valve that we're going to be testing. This is the Sapien 3, which you saw the kind of aortic compression it could potentially cause. Um, and that's what we're using now. But sometimes we have cases where even the Sapien 3 isn't big enough. In this particular case, it was. We were able to put it into a native RVOT via a transfemoral approach, no problem. But in this patient, and I believe this is a patient um, of Dr. Salem's, um, the problem was that the RVOT was too large for the valve that we had. And so we performed a plication procedure where a uh, surgical mini sternotomy was performed. Um, the surgeon goes in, plicates the main pulmonary artery slash RVOT, basically cinches it down 
um, so that uh, we have a landing zone created and then we can go from a sub xiphoid approach right there and implant a large diameter uh, transcatheter valve. So that's a nice technique. I think we're up to six of these now and uh, for the most part it's gone very well. Let's talk a little bit about tricuspid valve surgery. Um, and how we can potentially avoid repeat tricuspid valve surgeries because um, really tricuspid valve surgery is, is not a simple surgery and it does carry a significant risk of morbidity and mortality. Uh, this is um, from the uh, um, uh, nationwide uh, inpatient sample database uh, uh, and you can see here that uh, the mortality rate runs about uh, 8 to about 12 percent. Um, this is uh, from the SDS, again, 8 to 10 percent risk of surgical mortality. Um, another paper here showing that uh, 20 to 30 percent of patients with moderate or severe tricuspid regurgitation that undergo tricuspid valve repair have recurrent moderate or severe TR within five years. So um, is there some way that we can help these patients? And many of our adult congenital patients are exactly this. So this is a recent publication that, that Dan and I were involved with. Um, looking at tricuspid valve in ring implantation, and it was a multi-center um, effort uh, here. Uh, and what we found is that, yeah, we could do it, and the mortality rate is very low, but frankly, it's not a great uh, procedure for a number of reasons in that about 75, no, I'm sorry, 77% of patients had perivalvular leaks. Um, which makes sense. You're trying to put a circular valve into a ring that is not completely circumferential. So uh, you can then build a beaver dam and, and you know, plug up the perivalvular leaks, but um, it's not a perfect solution. But sometimes it's better than the alternative. Take this case example here. This is a 49-year-old female with detransposition of the great arteries, um, had a mustard operation, uh, developed severe systemic tricuspid regurgitation despite having undergone a tricuspid valve surgical annuloplasty repair using a 30 millimeter ring. And she had um, uh, RV systolic function that was moderately reduced. Uh, she was um, uh, in advanced, she had advanced heart failure symptoms. She'd had five prior sternotomies, was considered high risk for repeat open surgical repair. So we were considering uh, doing a hybrid transcatheter tricuspid valve in ring replacement. Uh, the largest uh, valve available is 29 millimeters. Is it feasible? Will it work in a 30 millimeter ring? We thought it would. <clears throat> This is the CT scan of the patient, and it's really integral uh, and important for us to use the multiplanar reconstruction functions uh, that are now available on a, on a number of programs. And, and really, I want to thank John Moriarty and, and Paul Finn for teaching us how to actually do this uh, using Osirix, because it's really helped us along. Uh, so we do this, and we go, okay, well, we think we can do it, but let's be completely sure. So we uh, uh, had a 3D print made uh, of this patient's heart, and not the entire thing, because that would be really expensive. Um, and instead, we, uh, we used, and this was when we were sending out these prints to a company called Materialize, and what we did was we said, okay, if we go in through the apex, how will this look when it goes into this uh, position? And it looked okay, but it sort of was milking back here. This is the Sapien 3. So then we tried the Sapien XT here, and we actually tried it in the same ring. And I, I'm a big believer in this, these kinds of practice runs. Um, and if we have the, the um, infrastructure in place to do these 3D prints, get some of these devices from the companies, get some of these rings from the companies, it's always nice to, to do this on a bench top before going in and actually putting a human being through it. And we were pretty confident that this would succeed. So here's the uh, patient now in the hybrid cath lab severe TR, systemic RV, and we go in through the RV apex here, um, uh, through a, really a mini thoracotomy, balloon size the, uh, uh, the valve, implant the Sapien XT, um, very easy, straightforward procedure to do. Honestly, it's much more difficult to try to do some of these things. Uh, uh, sometimes using a transvenous approach, we would have had to do a transeptal puncture through baffles, and um, we didn't want to. We didn't want to deal with any of those. We didn't want to deal with all the pacemaker leads and all that. So instead, we decided to do it this way and had a pretty much a perfect result. And this valve has now remained competent for over a year, and the patient went home within two days, I believe. Uh, saved her a huge operation. This is another patient 
uh, with uh, coarctation of the aorta, who had been repaired uh, uh, as a child and has a recurrent coarctation, but she has absolutely terrible vascular access. She has no right femoral artery that I could find, and I, we were able to get into the left femoral artery, but it's absolutely tiny. There's no way we're going to be able to put a stent platform through there. So we should have cleaned this up a little bit to, so it's not so bloody when we show it. But, but be that as it may, uh, we decided to go with a hybrid approach um, via a, a right subclavicular approach, basically where a pacemaker would, would usually go. Came in from uh, the right subclavian, implanted a, oh, it's not playing, that's unfortunate. Anyway, implanted a stent um, in this location and lo and behold, as we did a rotational angiogram, we noticed that we had created a, con a contained rupture, or pseudoaneurysm, at the site of repair. And this is back in the day when we did not have um, the CP stents, the covered stents available. So we cut the leaflets out of a melody valve, and we used the melody valve as a covered stent. Uh, it's not going to play here, but, uh, and treated the uh, a rupture that way. Oh, there it is. So gone is that pseudoaneurysm, an expensive way to treat it, but took care of the job. Now, a few years later, this woman came back with progressive homographed aortic regurgitation. She had an aortic homograft that had been uh, placed a few decades ago. And again, we decided to go the hybrid route, except this time, instead of going with a right subclavicular, we went with uh, an apical approach uh, via a mini thoracotomy. Uh, and implanted a sapien XT valve in that position. And there's the uh, melody valve with the leaflets cut out in the descending aorta. So, uh, you know, saved this patient two uh, large operations potentially uh, by, uh, and didn't have to go on cardiopulmonary bypass by approaching it this way. This is actually the first hybrid procedure I ever did. And um, this was a patient that Dr. Lax was operating on who has um, very complex anatomy, transposition, dextrocardia, needed the RV to PA conduit replaced, and needed the mechanical uh, tricuspid valve replaced, and had a sizable uh, subpulmonic VSD that just couldn't be visualized, either from the aorta uh, or from the atrium, was, was, uh, was in a difficult position. So uh, we got a call down to the OR and uh, came down there. And, and actually, and I, I give, you know, I got to give Dr. Lax a, a ton of credit for, for being really so creative and progressive, because he, he, uh, he said to me and Dan, he said, well, well, can't you just go ahead and, you know, put your devices in directly through the RV free wall and uh, uh, put them across the VSD, and that's exactly what we did. We put a sheath through the RV free wall, uh, crossed the uh, VSD with a wire here, and then ended up putting two overlapping devices and closing the VSD. So, um, and then sometimes you have VSDs like this. This is a patient uh, with um, a coarctation, and they're known to develop um, accelerated coronary disease who had an absolutely massive MI. And essentially, this isn't a single ventricle, this is a um, this is a um, uh, uh, post-infarct VSD where the septum's essentially completely ruptured. And so this patient was in the OR with one of the adult cardiac surgeons and been gone on ECMO and they put him on a Centromag. And so um, the question was, you know, was there anything we could do with devices in this patient uh, just because surgical patching uh, was probably not going to hold? And this is the largest diameter Amplatz receptal occluder that we have, the 38 millimeter ASO. This is meant for closing ASDs. But you know, there's, it's not like God said on the eighth day, thou shalt only use it to close ASDs um, because it's actually not that bad for closing VSDs. And we still had a little bit of a shunt, but certainly much improved. Um, so, conclusions. Transcatheter interventions in patients with CHD are feasible and beneficial. Mastery of diagnostic uh, catheterization techniques is key. Understanding non-invasive imaging is absolutely key. You have to understand the anatomy, uh, the hemodynamics, prior surgical approaches, the imaging armamentarium is so key and, and really previewing cases. And then there are so many potential advantages to these hybrid uh, interventions. Um, and those include um, surgical access to facilitate delivery of devices and valves to difficult to reach areas, access to areas uh, by the wires and catheters that may be difficult for the surgeon to visualize. So it can help us and it can help our surgical colleagues. Uh, decreasing cardiopulmonary bypass time, uh, or avoiding cardiopulmonary bypass altogether, and then smaller incisions, and hopefully more rapid healing. Uh, thank you very much.